Thank you. We're going to bring everybody up here. We'll see if this works out, if we have the right number of seats. All right. So um, as you can see, we have a large number of people up here who represent all parts of the world. Um, what an amazing crowd for uh, this early in the morning and a topic like this in Traverse City, Michigan. You should give yourselves a hand. Um, the, the title of this panel, as you all probably read in your program books, has something to do with foreign. Um, and we've already had some pushback from the panelists about the use of the word foreign. Um, because they don't consider themselves foreign. Um, and, uh, and, and in reality, uh, you know, as you all know, one of the wonderful things about film is it's a way for people from all parts of the globe to be communicating with one another about their cultures and about the things that are going on that are important in the world that we may not be aware of, et cetera. And, um, and one of the things, of course, that's happening in the world right now is all sorts of geopolitical borders are under pressure. So, um, so these folks don't consider themselves necessarily citizens of anything other than the world and the need to communicate um, with everybody on the globe. Having said that, um, what I want to do is just go down the line here and have everybody introduce themselves, which is a lot easier than me trying to pronounce um, these world names. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and to tell us a little bit about uh, who they are and the film that they are here with uh, so that you can get a little bit of context for the conversation. We're going to start all the way down on the end with Shosh, who um, actually has to leave about a half hour into the conversation because she has to run to her own Q&A. Um, and then we'll come down the line this way. So Shosh, you want to start out? Yes. Hi. A, there, there are microphones for everybody. Hi. So very, very honored to be here um, the next time. My film is uh, Web Junkie. I am the director and producer. Um, I um, started it in 2010, and it was premiered in Sundance last winter. Um, I went to do a film in China about internet addiction. China is the only country in the world to declare it as an addiction. But what brought me to do this film is the thought that technology became the architect of our intimacies and changed human relationship that I'm very concerned about. Um, and this is the reason that brought me to China because China established more than 400 rehab centers to reprogram children. They are tricked to get in and they, I, they are behind bars for four months, going through therapies, uh, very strict military discipline, and are getting uh, pills. So um, my, uh, you know, my meeting them in China brought a lot of questions to me, and the journey that I would like to share with you, maybe I'll be able to do it later. Okay, next, Niels. Uh, good morning, I'm uh, Niels van Koevoorden. Uh, I'm here with a film called Ne Me Pa, or the English title is uh, Don't Leave Me. Uh, I made it together with uh, Sabine, my co-director. We edited the film together and uh, we did the whole process, uh, like the two of us. Um, we were raised in Belgium and we made a film in Belgium, but we're actually both uh, Dutch, so we made a film in our home country, which is now kind of a foreign country for us. Um, it's the first time uh, that a film of mine is doing like a bunch of festivals in the US and it's, it's very funny I think for us to see how different a US audience reacts to a film about uh, two guys who really drink too much and uh, go down the hill. Uh, <laughs> 
in a film that doesn't really bring a hope or a, a solution to, uh, to their problem. <laughs> um, but we had a first screening yesterday morning and it was, was really nice to, um, to talk with the audience here and it was really interesting questions, questions that we never had before, topics that were... Um, I don't know. It was a was was a really good start of uh, of this week. So uh, I'm going to hand over the mic to my co-director. Hi, uh, my name is Sabine Lubebakker. So I'm also um, for uh, Don't Leave Me or Ne Me Quitte Pas. I think for us it was very funny that um, well we've we've shown at a couple of festivals in the U.S. and um, and we got in general we got very good reactions. Uh, something we never expected actually this film would ever go come here. And I think we got one critique, and um, it was uh, like what you said. It was uh, this film is showing all these problems, and it's not giving any solutions, which um, we think actually is kind of a compliment. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a, it was a critique. So I think for us it was very interesting to see how it's perceived by by I, th I mean like the US, U.S. is very big, so it's uh, very different. Although it's still a very important place where if you can get your film out is very important and very good if you get it out in the US. So um, so we hope if you guys see it that you like it and you tell all your friends. <laughs> Thank you. My, my name is Emmanuel de Merode, um, and I, I feel very privileged, very touched to be here because I've, I've never made a film in my life, but I'm not sure why I'm here. Um, <laughs> um, but in a way the the reason I'm here is because I was very involved in a film, which is a, a film called Virunga, which is a, about a national park in eastern Congo. Um, about six years ago, I was nominated by the Congolese government to be the director of that park. Um, and what I didn't really realize at the time was just how difficult it was going to be with the outbreak of a civil war um, from the national park. And then the um, onset of another major challenge, which was the um, arrival of an oil, British oil company um, breaking into the park and exploring illegally for oil. So these two very major challenges that we had to face. And of course, we didn't have um, either the ability from a um, law enforcement standpoint or from a legal standpoint to really resist that. Um, and so um, it was at about that point you know, that we realized that, that I met Orlando, who is a filmmaker. Um, and we came to realize that actually film was perhaps one of the strongest weapons we could use to, to confront this problem. And for two years, we worked on this project. We didn't really know exactly what it was going to be until the end. Um, and it turned out to be much more than we ever expected. Um, and so through that, film became a very big part of our conservation and a very big part of our survival strategy um, in Eastern Congo. And so I've become a very passionate advocate of, of film, even though I still don't know very much about it. Hi. Um, so my name's Orlando von Einzadel. I, I'm, I have a very strange German-sounding name, but I'm actually a Brit. Um, and um, I, a lot of the work I do as a, as a documentary filmmaker is ha, has tended to be in 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 West Africa and and East Africa, um, and I was I've been looking to try and tell a, a positive story from from Congo, um, and one day I I was I was working in Sierra Leone and I picked up a, a newspaper, and there was a story about Emmanuel's team and the, uh, of Rangers, and they just rescued. Um, a, a mountain gorilla that had been t uh, captured by poachers, um, and I read that story, and I was I was really impressed by by this their sort of brave work, and that they were pushing forward these very ambitious development projects in in a very difficult place, and and so that 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 kind of optimistic and hopeful story from from Eastern Congo really appealed to me. Um, and um, I, I sent a couple of emails to Emmanuel and said, hey, I'm this filmmaker. I'd really like to come make a film about what you guys are doing. And, and he didn't reply. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I wrote a few more. Anyway, eventually someone got sick of me pestering them. So, so I, I got to go out and, and, and I started to, to, to sort of film what they were doing um, 
and it was it was amazing following following this the, the rangers and, uh, and and their work um and um so I, I set out to make this this positive film, um, and then I'd, I'd been on the ground a couple of weeks, and this this new civil war started. Um, and at the same time as this, the park had these these very serious concerns about what this British oil company was doing, um, and so you know I spoke to them about that, and and we decided to to try and look much deeper into into what was going on there. So. So the film that, that I initially set out to make became something very different, but I, I, if some of you are coming to watch it today or, t or tomorrow, I, I'd like to think that still there's still a very positive underlying message within the film as well. Hi, <coughs> my name is Jeroen van Velsen, which is a very Dutch name, you normally say Jeroen. Um, I'm a beginning filmmaker. I've made one film before this one. Uh, the film I've made um, at the festival with is called A Goat for a Vote. It's a documentary and um, it's set in Kenya. Um, why in Kenya? I, my film before this was also shot in Kenya. My dad's lived there, uh, moved there 30 years ago and I've been, I've been traveling to Kenya ever since. So a lot of passion I have for East Africa, especially Kenya and I get inspired very easily there to make films rather than in grey Holland. And, um, but um, <clears throat> what, what I just want to, what, what you said about making positive films about Africa, I think it's really important because so many films um, representing Africa as this dark continent where there's only poverty, uh, war and uh, destruction and uh, political chaos. And um, it is it is fantastic because there to, to to make something positive of 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 Kenya or Africa because there's such so many beautiful heartwarming stories there to find, um, and there's so much culture and there's so much nature and how these how they interact is uh, there is so much to film there and I hope a lot of filmmakers are will will see that and carry on making beautiful films about Africa. Uh, my film. Uh, in itself <clears throat> is about <laughs> political unrest and uh, problems uh, faced in society in Kenya, but I, you can always find a way to bring it in a positive light. My film, um, I try to make a film about corruption, about uh, women's rights, which are not much uh, happening in Kenya, and about, um, yeah, about poverty and um, political unrest, and I I found a school in Kenya that was, um, they were doing uh, presidential elections of the school, so they get to, uh, the students themselves get to choose a leader of the school. And um, my film kind of following three children who try to become president of the school um, represents what's really happening in the larger scale in Kenya. And it's, uh, yeah. I find it very heartwarming and because they are very dedicated children and they don't really see the negative sides of what they're actually doing, um, which is great <laughs> to watch. Uh, so thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Mark Cousins. I'm really delighted to be here. I'm <clears throat> Irish and I live in Scotland. Uh, of the films on the panel, I've seen Orlando and Emmanuel's and I absolutely love it. I've also seen Dietrich's Kreuzberg, uh, Stations of the Cross, and I absolutely love that. So two strong recommendations. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm just passionate about cinema. I'm, I, 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 uh, about internationalism, I would say. I would say I, my, the language that I speak is the language of cinema. I think I feel that all of us are all of us filmmakers. It should say on our passports, explorer. Uh, we are these people with a, hopefully a, a kind of centrifugal imagination, an outwardly direct, or directed imagination. That's why we go and make films about places that we don't know to learn to learn a, a, a new language. I think I'm here specifically because there's one film in the festival that uh, I suggested to Michael Moore and he kindly accepted it. It's called Bag of Rice. It's from Iran and it's a complete masterpiece and you'll find yourself sort of crying with joy, I think, if you manage to see it. My particular areas of interest or knowledge are African cinema and I Iranian cinema. This idea of foreign, I think foreign is a kind of failure of empathy in some way. Nothing's foreign if we empathize enough and I think that, I think that cinema is a kind of empathy machine. It's really wonderful at, at helping us see into the lives of others. 
Oh, well, hello. My name is Dietrich Brueggemann, and I'm from Berlin, Germany. And as he kindly pointed out, I made a film which is called uh, Stations of the Cross, is the English title. We had a beautiful screening at that other beautiful theater yesterday, um, after I had flown in for 24 hours or something. <laughs> so um, the film deals with Catholicism, and as Michael Moore put it, the, the Mel Gibson wing of the Catholic Church. Um, so if you want, if you want another uh, chance of seeing it, you you have a chance on the Sunday night, and um, yeah, that's that's it to start with. Hi, I'm Sandra Martin. <laughs> uh, my film is La Gran Familia Española or Family United. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm going to speak in English, in Spanish. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Eh, estoy muy contenta de, de que hayáis seleccionado esta película de todas las españolas. Creo que es una buena forma de acercar la cultura española a una cultura tan distinta como esta. I'm really happy to be able to bring this f very Spanish movie to another country so everybody can see what Spanish culture is like. Y bueno, mmm, la película habla sobre la familia, sobre todo sobre la importancia de apoyarse unos a otros. Eh, sobre no sé sobre cómo cómo se compone una familia cómo se descompone y cómo se vuelve a recomponer the the movie is about a family and how we can we construct our, we can make our own families and and families fall apart and we rebuild them and creo que es una peque una pequeña película que quiere sobre todo dar un poco de luz eh, olvidar los problemas y hacerte pensar que no sé que siempre hay alguien que te va a estar ayudando, ¿no? That, that there's always the hope that somebody will be out there to help you and that it's it's a, a lighter film and ¿qué más? No, que es una película muy bonita, muy familiar it's que a, it's just a a very nice movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, um, so as you can see, the real purpose of this panel is for you to be able to select the movies that you're going to want to see for the rest of the week. Um, so w one of the things that I was struck with in hearing all of your stories is that, um, with the exception of Sandrine, um, of Sabine, um, actually, or I'm sorry, I'm getting all, all of these things of, of Sandra. Um, Every single one of you made movies that were actually not made in your home countries, which is, you know, makes the the, the further argument about how, um, you know, there's not an international slant. My film was shot in Germany. So. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, we got one. Um, so, uh, uh, but but in any case, I'm just uh, you know curious about that aspect of things. If anybody wants to comment on the fact that um, you were drawn to stories in in other countries that uh, that you know, you decided to make movies about anybody. If not, I'll ask another question. No. <laughs> Shosh, you want to go? Um, yes, uh, I forgot to say that I'm from Israel. Please don't ask me about Israeli-Palestinian conflict. <laughs> um, uh, for me, and for many Israeli filmmakers, uh, it's very rare to make a documentary not in Israel. Uh, especially because of uh, financing it. Uh, so for me, it was the first time, maybe second, because previous film I made part of it in the US, uh, but it was the first time really to go so far. And um, it's very difficult, especially when it's uh, China, it's not your culture, you don't understand the language. Uh, it was very difficult, but very, uh, very interesting. And uh, when I thought about, uh, you know, this issue of internet addiction, I thought that I, um, I, I will go to a country that the phenomena there is very extreme. And that's what I found, because in one of those camps, a, a child was beaten to death. Um, so I thought if to bring up this issue, it should be very eccentric. And uh, I think that China today is a mirror 
to this problem of internet, if it's an addiction or not, this is not now the, the main question, a mirror to you know, an issue that the Western world is facing. But uh, usually um, Israelis work in their homeland. Mark? Uh, yes, I, I think there's always, the, there's always been a strong tradition of the kind of the migrant filmmaker, the emigre filmmaker, the, you know, the, the sort of mendicant friar, you could say, filmmakers wandering around the world with their cameras looking at, at, at places where they were not born and did not grow up. And one of the reasons is that I think that cinema has got this incredibly brilliant, precocious ability to be a window on the world, to throw open the casement and look outwards, to be outwardly directed. It simply is wonderful at capturing somewhere else and showing that somewhere else. And so if you're a filmmaker, uh, lots of filmmakers are attracted to that property of cinema, which is the window. We often talk about cinema being like a mirror that reflects ourselves, that shows us our own society, but the other great metaphor is the window. And so that's why, that's one of the reasons I think why filmmakers go elsewhere. And how, how difficult is it for um, a filmmaker to step into a country that they've, you know, that they have no, um, you know, personal knowledge of, and and just start making a movie? I mean, navigating that must be difficult, right? Yes, very, <laughs> very, very difficult. I mean, you have. I mean, in my case, I couldn't bring. Um, I made this film without uh, the government permission, Chinese government permission. So I needed, uh, I couldn't bring with me a crew, so I needed to use a local crew. Um, by the way, after the film was uh, screened in Sundance, Chinese government heard about it. Their reaction was, again, the West is accusing us of human violations, and they closed this specific camp. So work in another country, yes, you have a lot of, you know, production uh, issues, and mainly it's, uh, it's to manage in a very, very different culture. Well, um, but I think it's definitely true, it's always difficult on a practical level or productional level to do, but it's also like for yourself or I think like how you look at the world, sometimes a more exotic place can it's so much easier to, to get touched. I mean, in your own place, you're stuck with all the practicalities of life. And if you go somewhere else, sometimes it's so much easier. I think like what Jeroen said, like if he's in Kenya, he can see things, it's brighter, it's, it's, it's nicer, it's, it's, it, brings you, it, it, brings, it, it brings more reflection maybe in your life if you see things that are more strange to you. I think like when you are in your own country, you have you've just got like daily things to to deal with. So maybe that sometimes gets in the way to to keep your uh, well to keep your window more clear. I th I'd, I'd, I'd add a, a different point. Um, yes, for sure. It, you know, you, you working in, in Africa, where, which is many where I work, there's there's obviously lots of difficulties, different difficulties to is if I was to make a film in the UK. But there's also uh, specifically in our film, which which has a very kind of journalistic investigative angle, um, and some of the things we were investigating carried quite a lot of risk. Um, and actually, as an outsider, you're you're protected in a lot of ways because you can always leave your family, your house is not there, um, and you have that advantage that you can go and do, you know, potentially risky investigation. Um, and and if it gets too much, you can. Get out and go home, um, and and for local filmmakers, that that's you know that's can be is is very very difficult. So so there is an advantage on on one level. Well, um, I would like to add that <laughs> I nearly got arrested once uh, for a film, making a film in Kenya, and from my lawyer's point of view, I could have been put in jail for a very very long time, and um, I have heard of stories where that happened. So, but I do agree with you that, and I think it's very much our um, um, our obligation that if we step into somebody's life, and I think that's also with films we make at home, is that um, we are so much of people, especially I think abroad, because we bring our own cultures, our own way of looking at them, and it, you want to kind of um, film their or tell their story. I'm a really human interest story maker, filmmaker. And I think it's very, you have to do it very delicately and um, not kind of. Um, use the easiness maybe of, of maybe like one of my characters had um, 
60 brothers and uh, 60 brothers and sisters and it's very easy to say okay well if you if you <laughs> it's kind of yeah showing africa has got all these children and it's just gone wild and I actually just chose not to 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 show that element of my character even though it makes him very interesting to realize that he's got 60 brothers and sisters because i think a lot of people will just go what you know and well it's not about that. It's about um, him struggling to get food, and and I left that out. And I think it's you get a little bit closer to him. So I think you do have to kind of um, watch what you use, uh, what you tell of people. And um, but uh, I do I do find it um, I do find people very much um, um, worried when I go and film them that they're worried that I show the wrong things of them and it takes me a lot of time. I think the best films I make is when I spend a lot of time with them, preparing them and explaining who I am as a filmmaker and how I look at that person. And the more I can do that, the more the person can open up to me and be himself. And I think that's the most important part. Yeah. So let's turn this around a little bit and talk about um, why you're all here. Um, you know, I, I would imagine that many of you never heard of the town of Traverse City until you got the invitation to uh, to come here. And and um, you know, just in the context of of um, the reason why you're involved with films to begin with, and um, you know, wanting audiences to see your films. I mean, why would you why would you come to a place like Traverse City to this film festival? What's in it for you? <laughs> Dull thud here. Yes. Who wants to dive in? Come on, somebody. Um, well, sorry. Should I, enter? sorry. I think in my case, I've, I've never been to a film festival before. Um, and I, I may, I think I probably won't go to a film festival again. Not because I'm not enjoying myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, I think but you should just, add no offense. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. No, really, it's um, this is one I I I would have um, I would have chosen from a very very much an outsider's perspective, um, because um, really, what one of the key things we were looking for in this film um, is t the you know the notion of generating creative ideas to an impossible problem, um, and I think you know film was the instrument you know one of the instruments to do that, um, and I think. Travis is, of all the film festivals, the one that has that creativity um, to be able to really, you know, challenge these these ideas and these problems and how how to go about it. I think, you know, in in our case, um, we weren't going to achieve very much through classical approaches to campaigning. Um, we we've got to come up with something new, and if we don't, um, we'll. Um, will crash, um, and that's you know that's a guarantee. I wasn't planning to go to a film festival. It's just not um, it, it's not what I've ever thought of doing, um, and um, I'm actually extremely glad to to be here for that reason um, because I think it is the the sort of creative hub that can generate those those kinds of ideas that would that would be very um, helpful to us and hopefully something that we can offer something in return to people who are facing similar sorts of challenges. Mark, you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, we travel a lot. We travel around the world with our films, you know, and uh, people, when you get somewhere, people say thank you for bringing your film. And you, what, what you want to say is, no, it brought me. It's like the film takes you by the hand to different places. And then you come to a place like Traverse City and you encounter a hunger for cinema. That's, uh, this is my third time here. This incredible ne desire to be nourished by something beyond the, 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 the rather limited range of, of movie food that we get through, throughout the year. And that kind of a desire to be yeah, that hunger, like as you said this morning, like how many of you have turned out today, um, that that's that has 
that's really exciting. That then nourishes us. You know, I feel that there are certain film festivals like this one. There's one in Wroclaw in Poland, which is so inspiring also. Uh, Telluride in Colorado. There's film festivals around the world that don't feel that they're there just as a kind of shop, shop window, a kind of retail outlet for the film. That fe they feel as if they've got deeper roots than that. They're, they're, they're about community building. They're about reaching out, etc. And this one. So that's specifically the flavor of Traverse City, I think. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things I'm getting at is the larger question of what the role is of a film festival in the life of a filmmaker of film. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you don't make films with the idea that they're going to sit in a closet. You want people to see them, and festivals are, uh, have an important role in that regard. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just curious, um, uh, all of you, in terms of uh, just your general festival travels and, um, you know, what you feel like you're achieving, um, you know, for the, for the films themselves and for you personally. Sure. <clears throat> so so this, this, this film fits into, a, uh, Virunga fits into a wider campaign to try and protect the Virunga National Park. And, and just to give you, to tell you a little bit about this park, it's, it's Africa's oldest national park. It runs along the border between Rwanda and Uganda and sits in eastern Congo. Um, it's one of the most biodiverse spots in the world and it's also home to the last of the world's mountain gorillas. Um, and on top of that, what's, what I think is, is particularly special and unique about Furunga is it's, it's very people focused as well. The park isn't just protecting animals for animals sake, it's, it's using its resources to try and help push development um, uh, for, for people in Eastern Congo and, and hopefully with that comes further stability and lasting peace. Um, and and you know the, the the park faces many threats and, and the, the film documents those threats. And as I was saying, it's part of a bigger campaign. There's, there's elements of that campaign which which are legal. There's elements which are political. But the film fits in, into a, a public awareness campaign um, or, or the public awareness element of that. And so so you know we've been taking this film around and, and screening at lots of film festivals. And it's to try and show as many people in the world what's happening in this park and try and get people engaged and motivated. And it's not just to protect Virunga for, for the people on the ground and for the animals in Virunga. It's also, uh, it, it's, it's, it's about much bigger things because what's happening there is, is really, it's, it's urgent and precedent setting. You know, such a small percentage of our planet is, is protected under UNESCO World Heritage Site status. These are, these are parts of the world where you know, humanity decided we should not go and destroy for oil exploration or to build mines in these places or, and what have you. And and if we, if, if humanity lets Virunga fall, you know, if we let this place fall in the face of shadowy business interests, which is what's happening there at the moment, you know, what what is left? What's sacred? You know, when, when will we destroy Yellowstone or, or you know, or push forward the, the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef? So so that's why that's why we're here. Effectively. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, um, I heard Yellowstone is a huge volcano, that so one day it's going to destroy itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, but uh, I'm digressing. Uh, wh why do filmmakers go to festivals? Sorry. Um, when, when I think about it, I come up with four main reasons apart from the basic joys of traveling you always experience. And that is just. Um, to, to analyze it rather coldly, it's four reasons. It's, um, I'd say, prestige, business, mingling, and audience interaction. And that's the four reasons. I mean, prestige you get in certain festivals, like the top-notch ones, like Cannes or Berlin, or you play like Venice competition and you win something. And that kind of, uh, of course, it's, it boosts your career. It's like, it's like in a computer game, the avatar you play has got s some new powers. So in... Um, it's, it's, that's prestige, but that's only with like the top-notch film festivals, and then then it's business, of course. When you have um, distribution in some country, like the the Spanish distributor, they they bought our film, they're going to release it. So they tell me, all right, you should go to that festival because th that journalist is going to be there, and you, we might do some interviews there. And this guy's really important, and he loves your film, and he's going to do something for us. So it's better if you go. So that's business. And then there's of course mingling, like you know, bumping into other filmmakers and having conversations, and sometimes making friends, which is really part I do love. I mean. Sometimes it's always just the usual conversation. Oh, I, I, I haven't seen it, but I, I heard it was brilliant. So, um, 
But sometimes you, you, you really do make new friends at festivals, and then it's always audience interaction, which is, of course, always fun. I mean, it's, it's so different in all those parts of the world, and, and you, you, you really see how films make a connection between uh, you and those, f in my case, fictional characters and you real uh, characters. And you, you have that in almost every festival, not in every. Like, for instance, Shanghai Film Festival. Like, mo most film festivals are, are made by enthusiasts, like, like bottom-up. There, there's a group of people who really want it. Shanghai, for instance, is different. It's, it's political leaders decided we, we need a film festival, so let, let's do one. It was like top-down. So you, you, you find yourself in the screening of your own film with uh, four people who then walk off, yeah. so no audience interaction in Shanghai. But um, <laughs> this is better. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd actually, um, uh, we'll get to you in a second, Mark, but um, I'd like to ask Sandra, you're the one person on the panel here with a, with a not a documentary, with a fiction film. And, um, and so what would, you know, I understand especially documentaries that are issues oriented, wanting to evangelize around the world about the issue that they are associated with or that the film is about. But for a film like yours, why would you travel to a film festival like this? You came a long way to be here. Sí, la verdad, nunca he ido a un festival fuera de España. Y la verdad es que este me parece muy interesante porque junta muchísimas películas de muchísimas culturas, de muchísimos países y lamentablemente muchas de estas películas no van a llegar a España y para mí es una gran oportunidad estar aquí, poder verlas y poder conocerlas y aunque sea luego buscarlas y... ¡Ah, perdón! <risa> ¡Sorry! <risa> I've, I've never been to a film festival outside of Spain, and so for me to be able to come here, it was a great opportunity to see all these films from all these different cultures, and then I lost you. Sí, lamentablemente nunca voy a, o sea, en España muchas de estas películas no van a llegar. There's a lot of, so many of these movies will never get to Spain. Y para mí es una oportunidad estar aquí, poder verlas y poder decirle a, a la gente de España las buenas películas que hay fuera de. And la it's a, it's an opportunity for her to be here and to see some of these movies and to go back to Spain and tell people some, about some of these really good movies that she was able to see here. So um, I have one more question and then I want to throw it open to the audience. But uh, just um, aside from film festivals. Uh, how would anybody, if, if these folks call their relatives in other parts of the United States and say, wow, I saw this incredible film, you really have to see it, how, how are they going to be able to see your films? Are, th are there ways in which these films are going to be available other than through the film festival circuit at this point, or are you working on that? Just anybody dive in. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, well, our, our film is, you know, Luckily, last week we we signed a deal with with Netflix, um, and so Netflix are taken on the film as a, as a Netflix original film, and it goes out on the eighth of November. Um, <laughs> so I'd urge you all, if you don't see it here, to to, to tune in then and, and then watch it. And and actually, you know, part the reason we got a distribution deal in the first place was because of film festivals. You know, you, it's at events like this where where people who work for you know, programmers like Netflix or HBO, they come to the film festivals to watch the films. Um, and yeah, we, we, we screened at Tribeca in April and, and the Netflix guys were there and they liked it. And five months later or whatever, we, we have it at a deal. So, um, so, so yeah. So what's the phone number of the Netflix guy? <laughs> <laughs> we'll pay you, we'll pay you. No, I think, uh, yeah, we're also working on a Netflix deal. <laughs> no, uh, I think we're still kind of in the last, I don't know, in the last phase, in the middle phase of festivals. And I also just wanted to say about the festival thing is that I think for us both, fe the, uh, traveling festivals is also a way to um, to say goodbye to your film slowly. Like to, um, it sounds a bit strange because you're working with a film and with characters for like, with, for us it was a four year process now. And um, it's hard to say goodbye and start something else or to do uh, another film with the same intensity at the same time. So it's really nice to, um, 
I don't know, to we, we premiered on Itfa in Amsterdam, which is our hometown, which was the, the greatest premiere you can, can have with all your friends and family. And then you go to, we went to True Falls, a small town festival in, uh, in uh, Missouri, which was really nice. Then we did the whole Tribeca, uh, New York thing. And we, now we, we are here. We and did get a distributor who wanted to talk to us. And he said, like, if you pay $50,000, then you, we will bring your film out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that was it. Yeah, so, th like, the... We had to put money to bring our film in the cinema because you have to um, to buy out uh, a few screenings, and then and then we asked him like, what can we lose and what can we gain? And he said, yeah, you can gain like one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and worst case scenario is that you lose thirty thousand. <laughs> but <laughs> for a beginning filmmaker, like we don't have thirty thousand uh, dollars to um, to get our film out there, so the only way would be crowdfunding, and we crowdfunded the start of our film, so we were kind of sick of crowdfunding. Yeah, and I think our film is also because it's um, it's not, uh, there's no urgency at all. Um, <laughs> although it is a documentary, it is, uh, it's it's really for people who, who um, I don't know, like it's, I think it's a very beautiful and uh, funny and touching and sad story and it's, and it's very real. So, so it's there's no commercial aspect to it whatsoever. So it's very difficult to get the film out there because it doesn't fit any profile. That it's not super feel good. It's not very uh, subject driven. It's and it's documentary. I think probably if we would put it in a fiction genre, it would be maybe easier to sell it. So, so for us, we're really struggling with it. So, I think anybody yeah. has tips, uh, <laughs> please. Well, it's also really really funny that the first review we got from, uh, I think it was. IndieWire, and it had this best buddy movie in years, and we looked at each other, and uh, we would never say that about our own film or put it in a box like that. Like it, we were really struggling with it. It's a documentary. In America, people thought it was all fiction. Like the first festival we went to, people asked us, like, "Okay, so how did you do this? How did you write this script?" And um, and it's it's a really uh, it's really another world of marketing and it's some it's also a thing that we can learn as Europeans I think to to get your film out there. And I, I think it's also really a business how to get your film out in the world. And if you're as filmmakers, I mean, we try to be as as much on top of it as we can. But it's I mean, it's it's really it's it's quite a job. Uh, it's not it's not easy. We don't know how the marketing works or how to put your film in the right place. I mean, we just we just don't know. So we're we just do what we can, and um, yeah, well, and that's what that's what we do. <laughs> Mark, you wanted to say something? I was just also going to mention something that's probably pretty obvious, which is nowadays there are thousands of programmers and people who select films for streaming websites or f film festivals, and quite often you're at a festival and you're hoping that amongst the audience there are some of those programmers. And quite often, a week later or a month later, you get an email and they say, you know, I've got a, I run a film festival in Brazil or in Croatia or Kosovo or Australia. Can we show your work? Or can we have a tie up with a local TV station or a streaming platform? And often that comes about. And you hope that those people are seeing a broad range of stuff. And particularly, you hope that they see your film and fall in love with it. You know, it's, it's funny because um, a lot of people don't realize that um, going on tour with a movie in the way that all of you are in some sense is a part of the marketing of it. It's a, it's a way in which that you can create a direct connection to an audience and hopefully that audience will spread the word and the film will get seen. And it's an obligation, particularly when you have a film that is not backed by big money, um, you know, to, to actually participate in that process. And it is a grind. And to what extent are, do you feel like you're prevented from moving on to your next movie by the fact that you have this ongoing commitment to you know, get your film out to an audience? I, mean, I don't go to every film festival. I mean, like this one, they described it. The invitation was very, very charming. So, <laughs> so, so. But in general, we don't go. We simply don't have the time. It's it's impossible. I cannot. Uh, I don't know. I mean, like we just. I we. I just have to work. So, every now and then, if it's really worthwhile, then then we we try to go. And we we don't get a personal driver like Tuck at every festival. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, every now and then you see you 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 go like, what am I doing here? I mean, this film, it's a technical thing. It shows itself. Um, I mean, I don't need to be present. It's not like I'm the band who needs to be on stage for in order for the band to play. So, um, and yes, um, getting back to that foreign 
thing. Um, it's nice to go to film festivals and have this all this international stuff, but on the other hand, you have a local market and you have the local business, and every country um, creates some kind of system how films are made and financed and stuff. And every every country is different. But the only common thing is um, cinema is expensive, so there's always some someone who decides about the money, whether it's private equity like in America or it's like more or less state-funded part of culture like in European countries. So um, what people often forget when they go like, oh, wow, I'm going to 100 festivals, is still the um, thing you need to do is support your local market. So um, the films I made before this one, they, they, they went to a couple of festivals, but not, not nearly on that scale that it's happening right now with this film. Still, they did well in Germany and they connected to an actual audience. Because the other, the other side of this festival thing, it's, it's kind of a bubble. You get lots of films on this festival circuit that you never see elsewhere and that never really connect to any kind of audience. So I'm always kind of ambivalent about this whole festival thing. And um, you see it in Europe, every, every country has really a cinema that it's divided in two parts. We have the, the cinema that only talks to local audiences like France and Germany and every country, all the Balkans. They have their, like, mostly comedies that don't travel. You can stop them at the border. No one else understands them. And then we have this kind of more art-oriented cinema that goes to festivals and is kind of respected. But there's not, not much business in there. So I've, I've, been, I've been thinking about working those, that kind of ambivalence. My, my earlier films, they were kind of within in the middle of that gap. They were like um, audience friendly, but not stupid. So um, this one is going to all the festivals right now, which is cool. Didn't have huge audience figures in Germany. And still, I'm, right now, I'm really thinking about making the next one probably set up to shoot in November and December. So you'll meet me at the very tail end of the whole festival tour. And after this, I'm going to sit down and do the next. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I'm just at the beginning of this. This is my first uh, viewing. It's my international screening of the, 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 the first viewing of this film, my film. And um, what's also really interesting to see is when you... It's so different when you start um, your film uh, or when, you're, when you end up in many bubbles with your film at the end of your festival, when the film is run, running the festivals at the end. Um, in the beginning, I find it, and I'm sure everybody probably agrees with me, you've spent so much time making this film that you just don't really know anymore what kind of film you've made. Uh, this is with me very much most of the time. So I'm dying to sit in the cinema with a bunch of people who are going to watch a movie, normal people, not filmmakers, not my mother, who says is everything is fantastic. <laughs> so, you know, and then really you get to feel, you know, people start laughing all together, or hopefully they do. Um, you really get a sense of what the film is communicating and when and where, and then you start to realize, oh yeah, I am a filmmaker, or this really does work. And it really helps you a lot, it helps me a lot to uh, understand what I've done and to get uh, the energy to make my next film, I think, yeah. And I'm, I might add that um, in an age where uh, things are heading in the direction of people um, consuming most of the work that, that you all do on Netflix or on cell phones or you know whatever, um, that the opportunity to see your film on a big screen and to interact directly with an audience is a completely different experience that is offered at festivals that uh, you wouldn't get otherwise. Um, okay, I want to open up for questions. We have one over there, yes. Use the microphone. It's not a question as much as a thank you to all of you because I'm really struck by your dedication and commitment and Mark, your comment about films that you make uh, can make us empathize more with other countries and the country does not seem as foreign. And I just really want to thank you. I can feel your passion and your commitment and how difficult it is. I might add, can I say something about Mark for a second since you brought him up? Um, <laughs> for those of you who are not aware, Mark has created this incredibly epic thing that's I, it's 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 bigger than a film called the story of film in which he does something incredibly remarkable um, by taking the history of film which we all think those of us who have studied it we all think we know and actually showing how international it really is 
because we're all focused for the most part on American films and European films to some extent. And in the story of film, Mark actually shows that the history of film includes just about every region of the world. So it's very, very much, I mean, Mark is a hero for those of us who have not discovered um, all of these international cinemas that, uh, that have been going on for as long as the American and European film industries have, but have been way less um, known, let's put it that way. So, yeah. Uh, down right. Right down here. Oh, okay, we have a question here. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> but Dietrich, you've got such a great sense of humor. How did you choose your topic for your film? Well, the topic kind of chose me. Um, <laughs> The great Walter Murch, some might be familiar with the name, uh, he wrote a book where at some point he says, it's about the art of film editing, but it's about kind of everything. He says, um, in, in the really good moments, you feel like it's all making itself. You have nothing to do with it. And these are the, the truly great moments where something kind of creates itself. That was a bit uh, what happened with this film. It just made itself. So, of course, we, we, had, um, we had had some experience with that subject matter, with the topic, had some like guest appearance in, in the Mel Gibson wing of the Catholic Church when we were kids. So we didn't uh, need to make much research about that. And then at some point the idea just popped into my mind of using those 14 stations out of the shape of, of a film and kind of perverting that uh, from, from Jesus suffering from the evil world to a girl suffering from, from religion. So. Um, when, when this idea had chosen me, I had, I had to make it. We have a question down there, yes. First, I'd like to thank all of you for being here. And it struck me 10 years ago when this festival began, our biggest question was, well, where can we see these documentaries? We're so obscure in, in being able to see them. And now we can say, Netflix, HBO, we can find them if we look for them. And so don't give up hope and don't stop making them. They're so critical. And also uh, to um, Emmanuel and Orlando, thank you for doing what you're doing. I've been to the Virunga National Park in Rwanda and was drawn there by a film, Gorillas in the Mist. And so what you're doing, and that was a long, long time ago. So what you're doing, I think can reach and, and stretch and really touch and make a difference. So thank you and thank you all for what you're doing. Question over here. I'd like to direct this question to the team at the end that uh, made the quote buddy movie that you don't think is a buddy movie. And I can see why. We have a problem in our country, you know, with guys, mostly guys, sleeping under uh, bridges. And uh, in my town, <clears throat> we've got some nice forests around. They live in the forest. Uh, they're not invisible people. They are in one way, but they come out on, on the streets at intersections and uh, looking for work or but they're, they're drunk or uh, they're, uh, they have mental problems. Mostly, most of these people are veterans. They came back from Iran, Iraq, and uh, all, all of the hot spots that we send troops to, they come back and the VA hadn't done a really great job. Are you aware of all that? Is there a relationship between what these two fellows are doing and, and our problems here? Um, I think the, the relationship is maybe that there, well, some, some people just, uh, their lives turn um, out differently than they have thought. Uh, I mean, what? No matter. Maybe you were a veteran. Maybe you were a truck driver. I don't know. I don't know if it really matters. Or for me, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it's just they. They chose this life, or maybe it chose them. Um, and they they try to see it as freedom. And I think it is also a, a certain kind of freedom. They are not bound to any uh, rules of society. But it's also because they place themselves out of society, so they also have a lot of disadvantages from this. So I think um, for us, we try to look at them as, as really being human beings with all their, uh, I would say, ambitions, but maybe in their case it's more non-ambitious. And maybe it's also something that that we can learn from. I, I mean, like that's what we were looking for. It's like they chose this life, so let's just look at them, what it means. 
It's also in I I remember that in terms of marketing, at one point we said uh, that our film is an ode to failure, <laughs> and it's kind of strange to also for us it's kind of strange because the film became in a way became a success, and it's a film about uh, really non-successful uh, people in our terms of thinking. Um, but if you take the idea of failure for granted, or you just say, well, it's not that, uh, uh, how to say, well, we kind of wanted to embrace failure instead of saying, look at these two losers, uh, because it can happen to all of us. And the funny thing is that when we were making the film, somewhere halfway, uh, we talked with one of the main characters about what the film was going to be about. And we were talking and talking and talking and talking, and he said, do you realize that this film is also about you guys, about us? And it was kind of a, uh, a, also a confronting moment for us because it's, uh, it's also about our struggle and our life and our, our thingy. Another question here? Yep. Uh, you kind of just answered the question I was gonna ask was, when you're doing a documentary and you get involved in somebody's life, how much responsibility do you feel after you're all done? And how does that connection with your subjects affect you for the rest of your life? I don't know. I, for me personally, I would never want to make a film uh, that is character driven, that I, I, I need to love this person. I mean, I'm, I'm going to spend uh, years with this person and I, I know during this time, I know this person better than my, my best friends. I mean, I'm, you, you really get into their lives. So it's a, it's a very uh, specific relationship, but it's, 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 it, well, you just have to, you really look at the person. So afterwards, you don't want to let the person go or you still want to be in touch. You want to know how he or she is doing. So, but I think it, it depends more or less how your life is going, how their life is going as well. But you, of course, you stay in touch. I think with our main characters, we try to, to call them, at least uh, as much as we can, and if we can, we p pass by them. I mean, yeah, I, I don't think they will they they will leave our lives or the other way around. Yeah. Mark, but sometimes you also make films about people who are, through their actions, making the world worse. So, for example, I I made a film about Holocaust deniers, young Holocaust deniers in Europe, and uh, the one particular guy who was Austrian uh, was a nasty piece of work, and he had. Um, committed a series of race crimes and and I I sort of I kind of even had some warmth for him but I felt a lot of hatred for what he was doing and uh, the, he he was imprisoned not for his race crimes but for what he said in my film for his Holocaust denial and uh, so he was in prison for quite a long time and then came out of prison which bothered me slightly and um, so <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, sometimes you make films about things that you hate. You make a film out of anger as well as love. Ira? Yep. Yes, hello. I just want to second the statement about Mark Cousins, who I think uh, created one of the most brilliant poetic uh, studies of the history of cinema. Yeah, I recommend it to everybody. I, I've seen several of these films, and I've, I loved Nemi Kedipa. It was like a unique film, uh, a documentary like I've never seen before. It was like a, a scripted documentary. I thought it was scripted for a long time. And you spend so many years the following race. these people. It's amazing. But um, I'm sorry I didn't see Dietrich's film, but I hear it was amazing. <laughs> uh, I did see the Virunga, and uh, I have a question for you. Um, it, that also was a brilliant film I saw in Tribeca. And outside of the theater, after it was shown, uh, it, the company that you uh, filmed, uh, the British oil company that came in to exploit the land in the, in the park, had a, a giant poster outside with disclaimers to every accusation you made against them. And I wondered what your response to that was. Do you still stand by what you said about them? Sure. I mean, it, it's, y y in the US you have... Um, you know, your First Amendment, you can, you can say a lot in a film. In, in the UK and, and other parts of the world, it's, it's, it's different. You, you have, every accusation you put into a film has to be backed up with evidence or you are going to be sued for the rest of your life. So every accusation in our film, I stand by journalistically. 
And in terms of putting, the company is called Soko International. There's a billion dollar company based in London. Um, the CEO is an American. The deputy CEO is American as well. Um, uh, they, we, you know, when you make a journalistic film, you put your allegations to the to the people you make allegations against, and then you know, responsible journalism, you include those allegations, you you include their responses within the film, which is what you saw um, when you saw the film at Tribeca. Their responses to to all of our allegations, which they they you know they have deny various bits and pieces, and and you when you watch the film, if 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 you do, you can make up your own mind if if what you, if you believe what they're saying. Um, yeah. Uh, in the back right. Okay. Yep. I want to thank you also for being here. Uh, we saw letters to Jackie recently, and <clears throat> I asked the representative from the film, uh, where will our children and grandchildren be able to see this film? And he said, they won't. This is the last showing. It would cost about $200,000 for this to get any further exposure. So that brought to mind a question, what can we as viewers and supporters of that film and the films you're talking about today, what can we do to help make sure other people get to see these things? The best thing, one of the best things you can do is write to your cinemas, uh, to your the local places where films are shown, and say, "I saw this and loved it." And if you screen it, I'll bring my friends. That 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 makes such a huge difference. It's a simple thing, but it makes a huge difference. Uh, and people do that in different countries. That really helps. Yeah, I mean, just uh, as a matter of interest, uh, letters from Jackie is a particular case because the film was actually made for for PBS. And um, and when they cleared the rights for the clips and for all the information that were that was in the film, they only cleared it for PBS showing, so they were not able to give it a real theatrical release. And in fact, PBS insisted, since they paid for the movie, that the film not be shown anywhere in theaters after they showed it. Um, and uh, and and it was actually a, a struggle to get them permission to even show it here. So that's a particular case. But I think Mark is right. I think it's about um, talking to everybody you know about the films that you've seen and pointing out where they are available and making sure that people know that there's all sorts of things available aside from what they're being spoon-fed by the large corporations that control just about every media outlet in the country. Um, I was just wondering, as this gentleman just said, um, that your film was brilliant and how is that as a filmmaker hearing that? Like, as you're going through this process of working on this project, and then actually like seeing it at the end too, I'm wondering, are you still looking at it going, okay, I could have done this, or I could have done that. How, how is that? How does that work out? I don't know, I guess. <laughs> is, is, was, that, was that to us? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of the other people here on the panel could could could, uh, could say this as well. But I I find personally, when when you've been working on a film for years, you you lose all perspective on it. And by the end of it, I mean I I had no idea if this film was any good at all. Honestly, I mean absolute truth. And and you know we we got into Tribeca, which was our world premiere, and it was a mad rush to pull everything together and. And on the night it screened, the first night, I, I watched about 10 minutes and then realized the subtitle was missing. And, and I was like, oh God, it's, it's awful. <laughs> and I left, I left um, thinking, you know, I went outside and had a drink and, um, and, uh, and came back and everyone seemed to like it. And it was, it, it, I mean, you know, it was an in, incredible feeling to, to feel that you hadn't, you know, I mean, you know, Emmanuel and and the team had put a lot of trust in, into into us to to make this film and tell their story in in the correct way. So, so it wasn't just a creative thing as a director that I wanted to make a good film. It was also there was a lot riding on it. So I I cannot even describe to you how how nice it was that people didn't throw tomatoes at us. We're here on the far right. Okay, question. Yeah. Uh, just curious, um, as a professor, I teach a class on a contemporary aesthetic issues, and we deal a lot with the idea of the other in multiculturalism in our classes. 
and you've been listed as foreign film makers, um, number one. You've also uh, chosen to be documentary filmmakers, which makes you the other in terms of economics, um, sort of like with fine artists, we're not doing it because we want to make money. Uh, we're doing it because it's something we feel the urge to do. Um, could you address what it's like to sort of be the other in American society that is so exclusive when you're coming from countries that tend to be inclusive of the other? To be excluded is the norm around the world. If you're black or poor or female or gay, every, most people are excluded most of the time. And it's those lucky, rich, white people often who, who don't, haven't been excluded. And they should be because it does you a lot of good. When there's a threshold and you're not allowed across it, it makes you reflect. It gives you a kind of awareness and a sense of perhaps what everybody experiences, which is extremely valuable. So it's like embrace the other, you know, embrace if, it, you know, we can learn a lot from like queer politics, for example, which says, you know, yes, we are other and we want to be that way, you know, or in the music world, what David Bowie did, you know, I, I am a Martian from outer space, you know, I am from another planet. That's how the human condition feels in some way. So why not? Why not think of yourself a Martian and all the rest of us equally so? We're all, you know, planet cinema. First of all, uh, thanks so much for uh, coming this morning and for doing this. It's, I think what the documentary filmmakers uh, do is heroic and so honorable and wonderful. And on this subject of foreign, I would just say, I swear it's a compliment. Uh, it's that, you know, we, we look up to you in many ways, especially fiction filmmakers, because your sensibilities are different and so uh, stunning and, and wonderful to us. We have to call it something, and so we've come up with this probably awful word, but we, we mean it good. <laughs> <laughs> My, my question is, is uh, for Dietrich and Sandra, who I believe are the only fiction filmmakers on the panel, and it's simply this. How would you characterize in your travels the, difference, uh, the differences between the audiences in your home countries and the audiences here? Well, um, particularly with this film, there is no difference. It's actually all always more or less the same. Um, seems to open hearts in the same way everywhere. Well, um, I haven't been to like totally different cultures with that film. I haven't been like in Central Africa or in, in India or China or something. So maybe it might be different there. But all this, the largely Western world I've traveled with that film, it's more or less all the same everywhere, which kind of gives me hope that the, the human universals are maybe stronger than th what divides us. To finally also make a kind of um, inspirational statement on this stage. <laughs> <laughs> bueno, en España tenemos una curiosidad y es que el cine español no está tan tan valorado como otro tipo de cine, ¿no? Es In Spain, um, Spaniards tend to look at other cinemas rather than Spanish cinema as, as being more important, as being worth more. A la gente que le gusta el cine, le suelen gustar las películas españolas y tienen una buena reacción. People who, in sp Spanish people who like cinema, uh, enjoy the movies and, and they have enjoyed her movie too. Y aquí veo que, bueno, tal vez porque es un festival de cine, pero veo que a todos os encanta el cine y la verdad es que no me esperaba para nada la reacción que, que ha tenido aquí la película. Perhaps it's because it's a film festival, but she wasn't expecting the reaction that everybody had to the film. Uh, people have enjoyed it so much. Tenía mucho miedo de que no gustara porque al ser otra cultura y al hablar de, de temas tan tópicos en España, pensé que no iba a gustar o que no se iba a entender del todo. She wasn't sure by bringing the film here if the if the themes would would translate into another culture if if um, the audience would be able to pick up on some of the 
topics that are very, um, very nowadays happening in Spain. Y estoy muy contenta de que and haya gustado según lo que me han dicho, ¿no? And, I, and I'm really happy that everybody's enjoyed it so much. At least that's what they've told me, and it's and it's, and it's true. <laughs> How many of you saw the film on opening night? Okay, there you go. <laughs> This, film, this question may work best for the fiction filmmakers, but it's open to everybody. Uh, the other night, I was going over with my son some films we could see, and I had suggested Stations of the Cross, and he looked at the description and said, it's about religion, I don't want to see it. Um, and I'd found a film review that points out the very formalistic structure of the 14 different takes, and suddenly he's very interested. And it, so I wanted to ask a question about form. How much... As filmmakers, do you let form help you structure the way you shoot your films or edit your film or design the film? What age is your son? 26. 26? Oh, I thought you were going to say six. <laughs> I was going to say definitely go to the... I mean, there's no such thing as pure content. It's as simple as that. There's no such... It's a fallacy that there's everything is shaped, everything has form. And as a filmmaker, you know, Dietrich says the form, for once he had the idea of the, tw of the 14 shot, you know. Um, some films are more content driven and sometimes, sometimes more form driven, but there's no such thing as pure content. Well, there is, and there is not, <laughs> you know. <laughs> In the 20s, we had abstract cinema, which was like only shapes moving around with no 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 camera use, just animation of, but no 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 pictures of nothing, just uh, stripes and triangles and circles, and that was pure form, I think, and pure content would essentially be not making the film, but just thinking about the people in your head. That's pure content. So. Um, <laughs> From from that clear extremes, it starts contaminating each other, and um, there's there's no clear answer. It's just just random ramblings, as you see. <laughs> and you know. You know the great uh, documentary filmmaker Robert Drew died yesterday, and he de he devised the idea of the mobile camera where you could film JFK, and he said that he was removing the form in some way, but he wasn't. He was just creating a different type of form, and it now looks very clearly like form. But I think the, if still the, the, <laughs> the categories are useful. We shouldn't discard them. There is no clear distinction line, but still it's useful to have those categories, you see, just in, by terms of communicating with your cameraman and stuff. Great, to the last question over, over there. there. Yeah. I was going to ask, um, in regards to filmmaking as a whole or storytelling, uh, what was the most important lesson that this film taught you guys? how to make a good film, how to make a great movie. Does that make sense? Anyone? Biggest takeaway from this process, All right. this project, this well, particular I'm project. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's very general, but I think at the end it's um, uh, really do what you want to do. Don't make any uh, concessions. Like you don't have to listen to your sponsors or your... Uh, just just do what feels good and take your time for it. Take, I think for, for us it was very much take loads and loads of time and do until you get it right without any concession. Uh, um, uh, the great American filmmaker John Sales said that what drove him was to put lives on screen that he hadn't seen on screen before. And you know, the great French filmmaker Robert Bresson said, try to show that which without you might never have been seen. That which without you might never have we been seen. We w would we have seen the Virunga story before if these people didn't make it? Would we have seen these two characters if these people didn't we make it? And that, I think that's where cinema gets exciting. When you look up on screen and see a life or a love a joy or a despair, a struggle or a passion that you haven't seen there before. And so I think that's the driving force, you know, and that's what people who are making films should be asking themselves. Has that been up there a hundred times before? If so, why bother? But if it hasn't, then bother. <clears throat> I kind of disagree, but agree. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be a theme. Yeah. 
I think coming to the idea of form, I think it's, I think, I think every story's been told, I think a hundred times, a thousand times, everybody's telling the same story. And this is the fantastic thing about international filmmaking, is that cinema is a, 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 like a means that everybody can understand uh, what they see. It's like a universal language. And I find we're at the same time, just to explain, uh, give you a nice example. My film I made before was called Wavumba, which is about an old fisherman living on a small island. And I went, after making the film, I showed him the film, um, and he'd never seen uh, a moving image before. So I wasn't actually sure if he would understand what he would be seeing. And he, um, and the sound was terrible. We had a generator, and the speakers were very small, and the generator was louder than the speakers, so he was just watching this big screen flapping up on a tree. And uh, afterwards, he just kind of came to me, and, it, and I asked him questions to kind of say, so, did you understand this, this, and that? And he understood more or less all the, uh, the major lines in the film. And I was really amazed about how, how cinema is an international tool to tell a story. But I find also what's great is that we're all we're always making the same stories, but form allows us to find new ways to, to, uh, to, to retell the story in a different light so that we can communicate a story uh, which, we, all, which we, all, we can all uh, respond to or feel close to and um, yeah, get really connected with the story. But I think about British cinema before the depictions of working class life were up on screen. Before that, British cinema had been showing a kind of very middle class worldview and very middle class milieu. And so there are always different types of human beings that haven't been there before. If you go deep down, if you're talking about the simple basic story structures, like the fables, yes, yeah. but in any other sense, like the, the the kind of the, the kind of social realities. There are loads of social truths that have still not appeared on this luminous screen, which is now 130 years old, and they still haven't got there. Why? Yeah, that's great. And you know, the thing is also, it's going to keep changing. Like those going to be new social structures will keep coming, and they they also have to be told. So there's like an endless array of stories to be told and people to 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 show on the screen, which is completely true. And think of given that a number of people have worked in Africa here, think of what Africa was on screen before the great African filmmakers, before Sombe and before mm. Mombeti, etc. Yeah, sure. It was Tarzan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, yeah. and then, and then f filmmakers themselves from Africa started making work. And it was like fireworks on screen. It was suddenly the scales falling from our, our eyes, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, Usman Somben, the great Seneg Senegalese director, said, we do not tell stories for revenge, but to find our place in the world. And I thought that, especially for West Africa, that has been a cru cinema has been a crucial part of of it finding itself in the post-colonial world, you know? So that, that kind of incredible newness, it's like the screen is freshly fallen snow and no one has walked on it yet. That's the, that's the magic, I think. Well, Ma imagine how much more fun this gets after these guys have had a few drinks. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean after? I've already got a few beers in me this morning. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question, here we go. I'd like to ask Sandra how she got the idea to make her film. Sí, es mi primera película. La verdad es que yo siempre desde pequeña he querido ser actriz y, y no sé, cumplir un sueño es para mí algo increíble. This is this is my um, first movie and I it's been a dream of mine since I was little to be an actress. Siempre he querido desde pequeña siempre me me ha gustado jugar a ser otra persona y creo que esta es la mejor forma de jugar. I, when I was little I was I to play it at being someone else, and this is the best way of playing. All right, well listen, I'd like to thank everybody for being here, for traveling as far as you have, and all of you as well. And go see a lot of movies.